hello there, friends, lovers. Thank you for joining us for a special edition of Five Minutes with Robert and Amy Nacer. Yes, tonight it is Five Minutes with Robert and Amy Nacer and Gene Moroni. Gene, thank you for joining us. It's good to have you on the show. How are you doing on this fine evening? I'm doing terrific, and I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you. Thank I'm just you. Bring up the chat here. I see Jim is already on the Facebook side of things. Stephanie is hello. Stephanie is on the uh, YouTube. Equal reality. Jim Ashley is also getting our numbers up over there. It's funny because we we simulcast, we multicast, but we're always trying to get those YouTube numbers up. Gene, you have been working. Well, I would say you've been working on happiness, but aren't we all? You have been working <laughs> on developing the concept of happiness in new ways, and this has been really exciting, folks. I've recommended before. I'm sure you were already subscribed to Gene's Thinking Directions blog, but if not, the link is in the description, both on YouTube and on the Facebook side of things. Uh, and and Gene, you're, you're becoming the go-to person for happiness. I know Don Watkins just published a really good article on happiness as part of his Effective Egoism program, but your latest blog post on, on the work of happiness, this is really outstanding. And, and let me get this right in at the beginning. We'll talk about it. Do you have you have a new course coming up on this too, right? I do. I do. I've done a, a lot of theoretical work on happiness, you know, two Ocon talks on the topic, which I turned into the articles in the series The Concept of Happiness and it's you know, it's it's a lot. It's like it's like 10 or 11 uh blog posts. And I haven't done in the thinking lab really systematically gone through all the tactics that you need and really make sure that there's one place where you can get all the tactics. And so that we're gonna start doing that April 2nd in the Thinking Lab. We're gonna, that's gonna be the main focus probably for four or five months. That's gonna be the focus in the Thinking Lab. So I wrote that article to kind of give the overview and uh, I'm looking forward to starting it. Outstanding. And I'm sure folks are already familiar, but all the information at thinkingdirections.com for signing up for Thinking Labs, as well as more information on this new program. You mentioned the talks at Ocon, and we've been fortunate to uh, attend both of those. The most recent one, uh, essentially applied happiness on confidence, was mm -hmm. particularly outstanding. At the beginning, <laughs> you mentioned that there's, some people would take it as controversial that you don't regard happiness as an emotion per se, and that was interesting. Yeah, well, you know, this is something that I think is important. It's not an emotion. It's not like joy. It's a, it's a continuous state that is mainly positive. It's not entirely positive also. That's the other thing. You can be happy. You can, you can be in a state of happiness with, you know, some ups and downs. It's, a, it's more of a long-term state. And I think it's important to have that attitude because too often people equate happiness with just pleasure and positive feelings. And there is no way to always be having positive feelings. The, the idea that you should not have negative feelings or unpleasant feelings, that is just mistaken. And if you have in your expectation that if you have negative feelings, you aren't happy, you're gonna completely misunderstand the situation and misunderstand the important information that comes in uh, negative type feelings. When I heard you, you say that at the beginning of the talk, and you outlined the three primary, uh, three of the primary emotions that, that flow from actually achieving that durable state of happiness, I thought if more people understood that, A, we'd all be doing better at applying philosophy and making our lives better, but it would also just knock out the Ben Shapiro's, the Sam Harris's, the people who say, oh, yeah, egoism is just do what you feel. And that's yeah, what, and that's. You can't have the emotion of pride. You can't have the emotion of confidence unless you are pursuing rational values in a rational way. And, you know, joy is just from gaining a particular thing, which you can sometimes get. People do get an out of context kind of joy, but you don't get confidence and pride that way. And you don't get love without having real values that you contemplate. And those are extremely important for ongoing happiness. And in fact, they're the things when you aren't getting the wins, when you aren't having the existential success, it's love, pride, and confidence that really maintain your state. And that's why, I mean, I, I don't want to presume, but I would say that's why the pain only goes down so far for Howard Rourke, because mm -hmm. 
pride, confidence, and love don't go away, even when you have existential disaster, as it were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that formulation of a durable state, that, that, that's powerful. Uh, you, you wrote, in the work of happiness, an egoistic code. We, we've got an egoistic code. That sounds obvious to us, but most of the world believes that your, your standard of value should be other people. Sacrifice right. it. Okay, so we've got that. We've got an egoistic code, and you say it's necessary, but you also say it's not enough. Yes, I think sometimes people think that if I just am rational, I should be happy. And uh, and that's not true. You need actual existential success, and you need also the psychological work to be able to have confidence and pride, which if, if you have things in your past, like if you are now being completely rational, but in your past you made some mistakes and you see in hindsight that you weren't rational or you did something that was self-destructive inadvertently, maybe, you know, whatever, you need to process that. Otherwise, that is going to undercut your confidence and your pride. It's, it's going to undercut your sense of yourself. And that can be done, but it is work that needs to be done. The other thing is that, or, or I think the main reason this is true is, you know, morality is an abstract code of values. When you look at things like rationality, integrity, honesty, independence, justice, these are big abstractions. And these are true for everyone. That's why it's a part of philosophy. It's true for every person because of the nature of our minds, because we survive by reason, because we need we need to actually figure out how to live. That's why those virtues are the virtues and they're shared by everyone. But your value hierarchy includes thousands of concrete values and that is different for everyone. And so you can't get from philosophy, which just tells you abstract truths, what is actually most important to you in a particular situation. You use the abstractions to help figure that out and you really can't do it without the abstractions. But I think in psych... In, in actually applying, in, in actually identifying your own values and making your own choices, this is where you really need to be comfortable with moving, shuttling back before between the concretes and the abstractions like Leonard Peikoff talks about, because you need to be able to see how your, say, being honest here gets you values that you care about. You know it should in principle, but how does it? You need to actually see that for yourself in order to um, really understand the significance of the choice in front of you. <laughs> so on the show, we always monitor the chat and the people in our chat, best podcast audience in podcasting. But there are comments along the lines of, oh, well, not me. I don't make those kind of mistakes. <laughs> and and it, a note that I wrote down as I was reading your latest article, your latest essay was, well, we all know what we want, right? We, we know what we want, don't we? Well... I, I, uh, it's, it's not the case that your values are obvious to you. Mm -hmm. Not all, some of them, some of them, but if you ever have an emotion that is a little puzzling to you, it means that probably the value that is giving rise to it, because values are what give rise to emotions, is probably implicit in some way. Unlike our concepts, like to have words, those are all formed explicitly. If you have words, it means that you thought about it consciously, you applied a word to it. Maybe you were imprecise, but you did all of that explicitly. But values get formed by action and experience. They get, you know, intention has something to do with it too. And if you want to strengthen values, that's how you do it. You set the goal and you act to gain and keep it. But if you in fact act in a certain way, you will create values in relation to the action that you take. This is the sense that a value is that which one acts to gain and or keep is really true. If you act to gain and or keep it, it gets stored as a value in your in your data banks. And that means it can create emotions. And I think it's very unusual for people to not have some kind of puzzling emotions where you know that this is not what you should do. Like, I mean, you're, you're procrastinating. You know it's a terrible idea to procrastinate unless you have a f- just aversion to doing this work, which in theory you actually want to do. Or you're on a diet and you know that you shouldn't have a piece of cake and yet you have a pull to eat the piece of cake. 
And those are just the common ones that non-objectivists, everybody has, right? But as an objectivist, you can have this also where you don't actually feel the pull of integrity. You see, gee, I think this is an issue of integrity. You don't feel any emotion associated with it. Well, that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It means that really the concrete values are not clear to you. It's like a floating abstraction in this case, and you don't see how it really applies. And this is very common. Um, I, I guess one other thing that I think is relevant I think sometimes people who think they don't have an issue with this are a little repressed. And so they don't think they have mysterious emotions because they basically don't have a lot of emotions. Mm -hmm. But if you are not in touch with your emotions, you are not in touch with your values. Mm -hmm. You cannot actually make a valid value judgment unless you are experiencing the feelings, the emotions in response to the values. You literally are not aware of the values at stake if you are not feeling emotions. So unless you've got some ups and downs and conflict in your life, you are out of touch with your values. And that's a, a terrible situation to be in, actually. You know, as, as you were talking, I was thinking on that topic of, well, we all know what we want. It seems like some of our most important values need to be discovered, um, I would say, on paper. And, and you, of course, are an expert on thinking on paper. And then the rest of them basically need to be found on a psychologist's couch and not necessarily oh. literally, you know, introspection can get us a long way. Oh, there's a third alternative, Robert. Yes. I think the most important way to, to get clear on your values is to set what you believe is a rational goal, something that you do think you care about, that you think is in, you've decided is important and you start acting to gain and or keep it. Uh, and gain it really if it's a goal because the goal always changes the status quo whenever you try to change the status quo you will bring up issues and in effect if you do anything that is not what you already have automatized as the thing to do you will start bringing up values issues that you weren't expecting and that is how you find your values. And if you if you set an ambitious goal, I think actually the best way to improve the psychology, which I mean, a lot of therapists would agree with me on this and would encourage their clients to do this. But I think if, 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 if you don't need a therapist, this is the way an individual should pursue it. Set an ambitious goal. Mm -hmm. Start working toward it. You will have all kinds of conflict and dif emotional difficulties about it work through those and my belief is you shouldn't go just talk to a therapist and try to understand what's going on in your psychology i think that is a wild goose chase and actually it can be very destructive because if you go and look for problems it's not that hard to find problems what you need to find is things that are actually stopping you from pursuing your goals and the way you do that is try to pursue your goals and see if anything gets in the way and that is now a priority to work on. And not only that, you've chosen a goal that you care about. So you now have the motivation to work on it because there's nothing more demoralizing than realizing, oh, I have, um, you know, like, a, like say, second-handedness. Yeah, I have a streak of second-handedness. I should do something about that. It's like this weight. No, well... Now, if what you want is you want to sell something to someone and the second hand in this is getting in the way of it, now's the time to work on it. And it's because you're trying to figure out some rational, independent way to sell that actually works and you have no conflict over. That's the time to work on that particular issue. Your goals actually help prioritize the development and the strengthening of your values. It sounds like um, in, in, the, in trying to be confident and trying to engage with your values and trying to go out there and reach out into the world and uh, go through some trial and error, actually set the goal and actually start acting towards it and taking those actions. It sounds like you, um, in your approach, you're giving a lot of leeway to failure. You're giving oh, yes. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, yeah, and so could you talk a little bit about that, about how to process failure and... Sure. Yeah. Sure. And that's tied with this idea that happiness does not mean life is, oh, just fun and nice and nothing ever bad goes on. <laughs> no, if you're pursuing ambitious goals, there will be setbacks. There can be actual failures. 
there, there definitely is going to be a tremendous, there's going to be discomfort. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's extremely helpful, two things. One is to recognize that the real thing that causes suffering, I talk about this in the talks too, suffering is really a state of conflict. It's not just a negative emotion, like fear by itself is not a problem. The problem is if that fear is like stopping you from doing something you want to do and you're pulled in two directions, that's when it's a problem. It's conflict is the thing that is the source of suffering, not negative emotions per se. Negative emotions are just alerts that there's something that appears to be threatening a value of yours. And if you you want to feel the negative emotions because they're what alert you, hey, there's something, maybe some value you weren't even really aware of that is being threatened here. And so, for example, if uh, it, here's a really common thing. It, it, you start to build a, like, this is actually happening to me right now. I'm doubling down in my business and I'm working pretty da darn hard and I'm having trouble scheduling social calls, right? I mean, I just, it has pushed out social calls. There's a couple other things that have caused that too. And I'm feeling a little conflict over that. And I needed to see I needed that to bring to my awareness, hey, Gene, this change you're making is actually shifting your priorities in a way that maybe you didn't realize it was going to shift it so that I can make a conscious decision about that. And then when you make a conscious decision, the uh, conflict gets reduced. So conflict is actually important information for you to figure out what matters. Now, it is important um, to be able to in effect, treat this philosophically, right? That you set a goal that matters to you. And the fact that you don't know how to do it on the first try, that's not the end of the world. If it matters, there are like a dozen ways to get any particular goal. It means you need to go back to the drawing board and figure out how to move, how to, how to get that. And uh, one of the other things I teach in conjunction with all this is how do you set the goals to make sure you don't go way down a path to failure because the worst kind of setback is when you realize, oh my God, I put in, I mean, I did this on an article once that was really like, this is one of the ways I learned this personal mistake. I put in 30 hours on this article. This was a long time ago. This was, I mean, this is close to 20 years ago, 30 hours on an article for my newsletter. And I realized, oh, my God, it was completely misconceived. It made no sense to do it. <laughs> it, was, I was, it was completely wasted time. Yes. And that is really demoralizing because not only had I not gotten an article out, but I was now completely discouraged about my skill, questioning my judgment, and I had nothing. I had nothing to show for it. Now, it's not actually true I had nothing to show for it because I could then pick myself up and said, well, what would I learn from this? And I did learn some things from it. But you don't want to have that happen 30 hours in. Right. <laughs> right? You want to have that happen like two hours in. Well, you certainly <laughs> develop resilience. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, the and so what I teach is with rational my rational goal setting class, is you need to take the goal and you need to bring it down where you're actually expecting a payoff sooner rather than later. A real payoff in less than two weeks and at least some kind of payoff every couple of hours. And that payoff is what guarantees that you don't actually crash if you decide, my God, I was on the wrong path. You have gotten actual payoffs in the last few hours, in the last couple of weeks. And so the effort is not totally wasted. And it's not just that you have to pick yourself up and say, well, this was a learning experience. What can I learn from this? Which is, I mean, you can do it. And that's what I did for years. But it is a lot better. And it is a lot better for your psychology. And it's a lot better for your confidence to pick yourself up on a, a failure that has happened in the last few days as opposed to took six months and now is right. Right. I think that's very important. Building pleasure into the process, I think this is also part of what creates a state of happiness. You have those tools and you have that resilience so that when you do have a failure, there's another reason it doesn't go down so far is because you see that what you did was worth it. You see the new information is new information and you still have some reservoirs 
to say, okay, how am I going to go at this next? And then you can go for it. That's excellent. I, I like that idea of uh, payoff within two weeks of, uh, of of goal setting and, you know, putting together milestones and putting together, you know, maybe this approach isn't working. I'll try another approach within that two week time span and you actually get somewhere with it as right. and keeping that momentum going. Um, and, and you said, like you said, building a process of pleasure into into right. this whole journey. Yeah, it's easy to say, well, uh, Howard Rourke would say, if you want to get things done, you must love the doing. It's a challenge to remind ourselves to do that and, and, and to have an idea of what that looks like in reality, as opposed to <laughs> what I call uh, deathbed self-esteem, which, right. <laughs> I, which, I, which I've seen people, you know, yeah. some of us, I think, have all made that mistake, but I've seen people live most of their lives that way, that they, they feel no matter what they do, it's all building up, and they can't really take pride in what they've done until they've done everything and they live their lives as if on their deathbed they will finally smile and say yeah yeah it was good that was good but there's a reason when 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 Rourke wants to have pleasure in the process that's because there are objective results along the way right so I mean if you just take an architect as a case when you get the sketch or like when he gets the initial concept you know, he stares at, uh, you know, the plot of land for a long time and draws it and thinks, what does he want? And he gets the first concept or, you know, he gets a couple of ideas for the concept. You can get a couple of ideas for the concept soon. It doesn't have to be the final concept, but you have something to show for the two hours you spent out there. And uh, I think with art, it's, it is actually built into the process. If you think of a painting, a simpler case, you know, once you get the, if you're doing a still life, once you get the thing set up, you have a sense, oh my God, that's beautiful. That's got the colors, that's got the texture I want. You actually see progress. And then you do the first drawing of it and you see progress. And the trick is to be able to turn on things where it's not quite so visible to figure out how to really see progress. Because I think sometimes people, what they do is they say, oh, well, I know exactly what I have to do. I have to do these 18 steps. So my first milestone is steps one through five. But in step one through five, you don't have anything actually done. You've just checked off some boxes and that doesn't count. And that will not give you a sense of completion. And if you can only really judge how things are going when you get something actually done out in the world. There's a real need for objectivity of results. And that is it's a creative problem solving process to figure out what, what that is when you think, well, I'm not gonna have anything to show for this for four months. Okay, what I say is don't settle for that. Let's start talking about this. What, like I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna write a book, but I'm not gonna have, you know, that, that book's not a good example because everyone knows how to do it in layers. But um, I don't have an example off the top of my head. I should come up with an example. But it's really, it can be a real creative process to try to figure out how to make that work so you can see some result. I, I came yeah. up with an example. You want yes. me to give you an example? Please. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've been working on, you know, I have this launch program. That the next one starts on Saturday uh, where we go for eight weeks and we everyone works on a major goal. And I always work on a major goal. And my most recent one, the thing that I needed was to become more predictable about my commitments. Like it was like, I realized I was too consistently overcommitted. I was doing something wrong. And you know, of course I thought of this only in terms of stop doing that. Right. Like, <laughs> okay. Stop it. And, right. And there would be no, if, if what your goal is, is to stop overcommitting. If you ever make a mistake about your commitments, you have failed. Right. I mean, it's like you never actually can see that you've completely succeeded. This is the problem with negative goals. And part of the challenge I had was to figure out, well, what is my positive goal that I'm going for that's actually tangible? And I came up with create a trusted system for commitments. And that's actually a whole bunch of physical things. There's a there's a I mean, some of the pieces I already had, I already had a calendar. I already had a, a certain to do list that I make with my assistant. But I, I now also have this big whiteboard with post-its on it. I have this stack of things. I have a 
a written process for how I do my weekly um, planning, I actually have things I can point to that can, that are my trusted system. And that's something that I built up over a period of, you know, six or eight weeks. And I can point to it. And I say this, you know, what's your trusted system, Gina? It has these eight parts. I do this, this, and this. I already had these four parts. I had to add in these other four parts. This is when I do them weekly or daily or whatever it is. I can actually, it's now like a documented thing. And that is was something that I could test. So like sometimes my key result was this week, I think I've got it working. I'm just gonna try to do everything the way I think it works. And the the result is a report to myself, does this work or does it need more tweaking? Now I'm guessing that as you complete individual tasks and those lead you to, compl- to actually achieve goals, that you get a rush from that. They, they, you, some value comes from it. And the reason yeah. I bring that up is because you mentioned, and we've talked about this before, one of the most basic but crucial distinctions is consciously, you know, intentionally holding a value orientation you know, versus a threat orientation. Mm-hmm. And I guess that would be the question is, as, as you put together your trusted system, Yes. How do you do you keep one eye out for whether it feels like you are putting burdens on yourself? That's a great point. You know, uh, one of one of the I actually I came up with an example. I actually that's funny. I prepared an example on that exact issue related to the scheduling system. So, like, don't be late. Totally brings me up. <laughs> oh, no, I might be late. Rah, rah, rah. Um, trusted system for me. That's like, yeah, I want a trusted system. I want to. Like, know that it's there. I I got that term from David Allen. He talks about the need for a trusted system for commitments. But like... um, I I love that expression, don't be late, because it's so obvious that you're not saying, you know, be on time, be reliable, be punctual, feel good about being there. Don't be late. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes things can be subtly threat-oriented. This is another great place where you, it's very individual. So like, be more, be predictable. This so does not work for me. It's like be predictable. Oh no, I'm not predictable. Oh no, I'm not gonna be able to do this. Oh no, you know. Whereas trusted system, I build all kinds of systems. It's like, oh, all I need is a trusted system. Okay, that conceptualization worked for me. And as a result, that path worked for me. Now, other people could get to a similar result through a completely different process. It's very individualized. And the test of whether something uh, is value oriented or threat oriented is what kind of what quality of emotions does it generate when you think about it and as I said trust the system it's like oh yeah confidence pride I was a system engineer before I went into psychology like systems I got that trusted system yes I want that whereas predictability it's like oh predictability oh <laughs> <laughs> Even though it's a value, it's a deep rational value. I think it's an absolute value. And yet, because of the very idiosyncratic associations I have with having been unpredictable, it activates a context. And this is a great example where objectivism makes all the difference. Ugh. Because the idea that knowledge is contextual and that you need to you know, reach conclusions holding the full context, well, part of that is the value context. And it's that value context that sometimes has some stuff built into it that's a little around the edges you haven't totally sorted out yet. And so that's why holding the full context sometimes brings up some emotions that are un- unprocessed value issues that you need to sort out. I almost certainly need to sort out some old baggage about having been unpredictable in the past. But I don't have to sort that out right now in order to put in place a trusted system and start becoming more predictable. And that is the key. You don't have to go solve all the problems. You just need to figure out a great goal that is going to move you in the direction you want that you can unleash your creativity to go get. And along the way, you will, in fact, untangle a lot of stuff. Excellent. We have a question from uh, Boaz on YouTube here. He says, what does it mean to trust the system? Uh, Which system? Ah. What is the system? (laughs) Oh, sure. So as I said, this is David Allen's comment, uh, excuse me, concept. Uh, And he's, for for those who don't know him, he wrote the book, Getting Things Done, The Art of Stress-Free Productivity, a a terrific Mm -hmm. book, which 
my very first newsletter in 2004 was a recommendation for that book. Uh, so what he means by a trusted system is some kind of set of tools and processes that ensures that whenever you decide to commit to something, like you're going to do this, you're going to make this phone call or you're going to pay this bill or you're going to, you know, attend this meeting or whatever it is, somehow it goes into your system and then the reminder comes out at exactly the right time so you can follow through on it. And he talked about, um, you see, you know, he had a number of different things, a calendar, a to-do list, um, yeah, projects. Tic tickler files. Tickler files. Mm -hmm. I have a tickler file. And he had a weekly planning process, a daily. Uh, he, he actually, I don't think, had a daily planning process. He actually used an organized set of tasks and then would just contextually decide what he was going to do at any time. Um, and so he, he explains a very specific system that he uses and teaches people. And a lot of people, they're black belts in GTD who just use mm -hmm. his system. His system didn't quite work for me. I learned a lot from him, but it didn't work for me. In hindsight, the real problem was I was so overcommitted. It was the big thing. So, but let me focus on the thing. So the idea of a trusted system is you have some way to keep track of everything you say you're going to do or that you want to do such that when you need to do it or you have an opportunity to do it, you remember it and you can do it. And so it facilitates you pursuing all your values. That's what a trusted system is. And as opposed to you say, oh, yeah, I'm going to do that. I had this once. I, if I borrowed money from someone, I put a little note in my wallet. And I remember one of my friends said, Jean, you never pay me back that $20. I was so embarrassed. And about two weeks later, I finally found the little white note in my wallet. I hadn't cleaned out my wallet regularly. It was not a trusted system. <laughs> right. I, I emailed my friend. I said, I finally found the note, you know, after I paid it, after she had to bug me. But that's not a trusted system. A trusted system would have told me the next day, hey, you better send that 20 bucks because you borrowed that money. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think in that regard, for, for an example for myself, as I always put um, reminders to myself in the future um, to get to a project that I know that I'm not going to be able to get to right away. Um, and I'll, you know, two weeks ahead of time, I'll go ahead and I'll put myself a, a reminder in my calendar. Yep. Um, that I always really love those. I, that's yep. such a, it's, it's such a way to treat yourself with love and kindness um, <laughs> when you do that. <laughs> yes. yes, because you, you know, part of it is, this is actually a great example where you're furthering the commitment to the goal. You are literally acting to gain and keep that value associated with the goal by putting it on your calendar. Mm -hmm. And that strengthens the value of the goal. And it, of course, alerts it to you. And when it comes back up, you remember, yes, I really wanted to get to this. And now I have a little early warning signal. So yeah. friend Harper in the chat says, think on paper, that's a trusted system. I I've got to say just personally to friend Harper, it's not a trusted system for me. It's it's an outstanding tool. It can be part of a great strategy, but I have piles and piles of paper that, uh, oh, yeah. you know, someday if ever files. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have 300, and I'm on what, 384 or something in my notebooks, yeah. It's, and that is actually part of the problem. I generate a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I generate a lot of stuff. I'm going through two notebooks a, a month right now. And uh, I really needed a way to get an overview, which I did not have until about four or five weeks ago. I finally figured out how to get an overview. The problem I had with David Allen's system is he wants you to do a complete weekly review where you look at every project and kind of get everything tidied up. And he had as a very systematic process for that. And I never completed one. I've, I've put in eight. I know I've put in eight hours more than once trying to do his weekly review. I believe I put in 16 hours at least once or twice trying to do a complete weekly review. I could never finish it, much less have it be something that I could do every week. And now I've got it down. It's about an hour and a half, and I can actually do it every week. And that has been the game changer, but it required talk about um, setting a goal and then having it bring up values you didn't know about. I mean, I was really unaware of some of the conflicts that I was going to come into to do this because you do need to reduce your 
you, you have to prioritize. You've got to decide what's most important. You need to, you know, I, I basically, in, in to do this, I needed to make my schedule a lot more rigid. And uh, I've always fought that, but I'm now working on a very structured schedule that's actually working for me. And it's working because I went at it in a value-oriented way. As, as a contrast, I spent a whole year, I, uh, another person I've learned a lot from is a woman named Brooke Castillo, and she's got a great program, and she has a, a way of scheduling, she calls it mon, uh, Monday hour one, and basically you plan your week Monday, you block out when you're going to do stuff, and you stick to it, and she has a process whereby you just stick to it. I tried to implement her process for a year, for a year, I worked, I I was miserable by the end of the year. I finally said, this is not for me. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but now in a matter of, you know, in a matter of about five or six weeks, I actually figured out the one that worked for me. This is something I tell my thinking labbers all the time. It doesn't matter. It sounds like great advice for someone else. It has to work for you. And this is such an important part of happiness. It's your values. It's you, you are individual. And you need to know your values. Yes. You need to know your values and you need to shape them. You need to prioritize them. And I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I've listened to and read the books by Brooke Castillo and, and not just getting things about nowadays it would be, you know, Tim, Tim Ferriss or, um, you know, Lewis House. There's a thousand coaches out there, but you're absolutely right. You, you've got to figure out what works with your I was going to say your work style, but really just your psychology, the way that you psychology. function. I don't mean to pick on friend Harper because one of the most powerful tools is absolutely thinking on paper. It's one of my failure modes is I'm just, I'm not a genius, but I'm just smart enough that I can get a lot done without ever writing anything down. And it fools me into thinking I can actually function that way until, you know, I realize I haven't written anything all week in my daytime or nothing is on paper. Yeah. None of my thinking is on paper. And I've just wasted a whole week. <laughs> things, have, things have fallen off the back of your head because it was too much. Yep. Right. Exactly right. So, yeah, I don't mean to pick on our chat there. Thinking on yeah. paper. If, if For folks who aren't familiar with, well, if folks who've listened to five minutes, they know better. But if you're not familiar, go to thinkingdirections.com, search the blog. And once you've gotten enough of what you'll find about thinking on paper from the blog, then you can sign up for Thinking Labs because you're going to want more. Uh, and there's a freebie. The freebie, you know, that what it's got one of those obnoxious screens that comes up and says, "Get yes. the thinking starter cup." Yep. There is an article on how to think on paper. There's a recording of a class where I teach thinking on paper, and there's important information about emotions and values. So, it's excellent. Free. Now, here, here was a mm, yeah. Get get to that. Uh, yeah. Well, there there was a there was a line in, and now this is, this comes from your most recent Ocon talk. Okay. A little bit of shift of gears here, but I but I kind of kind of loved this. You you. Quote Ayn Rand, you give her definition of happiness, happiness, that state of consciousness which proceeds from the achievement of one's values. Then you said, well, it comes from the achievement of one's values, you know, plural, not just a value. You need to consistently achieve your values to be happy. And then you said this, you said, this doesn't mean you need to feel positive emotions 100% of the time. Life is inherently challenging. You will feel negative emotions when bad things happen. But how much time you spend in that negative state depends more on how you react to it than what caused it. And that, that, of course, resonated with me and yeah. Amy because yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost too obvious to even bring it to mind that, of course, the way that you choose to process the things that happen to you are going to impact how you feel about them. The examples are all over the objectivist literature, but maybe not as directly as some folks would think about that. But but that idea that how much you how much time you spend in a negative state, happiness is a durable state. Hopefully, you know, 80% of your time you're feeling positive emotions, but how much time you spend in that negative state depends more on how you react to it than what caused it. When when you when you wrote that, when you said that did you have any specific examples in mind? Well, here are a couple of very common ones, right? So if you have any, if, if you have a streak of secondhandedness and tend to like focus on blaming people, like you're a victim of circumstance, you didn't get your goal. Oh, it was because so-and-so screwed up. So-and-so, uh, you spend all your time thinking about how bad they are and complaining about them. That, you know, 
every minute in that state, you are not solving this problem, right? You don't control other people. And if you, you need like Rourke, he needs some but any customer. If this one isn't the customer, he needs to start going out and finding the other customer. If this person is not the person who can cooperate with you to achieve this goal that needs some cooperation, okay, you need to go back to the drawing board. And if you have, you have the attitude, oh, gee, I'm really disappointed. I thought this was the right person. And even if it was injustice and even if it was immoral, mm -hmm. okay, well, now I understand that. I'm definitely staying away from that person. How do I find, you know, what do I do? What do I do now? I still have the goal. It's up to me to get my goals. How do I move forward? Or another case, if, you know, self-doubt is almost like an um, excuse, right? If you just, well, oh, I can't, I don't seem to be good. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you wallow around and, oh, I'm not good enough or whatever, you don't actually learn the skills. Maybe you aren't good enough. This is one of the things I, I think, okay, that came off a little bit, not in the right <laughs> tone. But self-doubt, I mean, it's really unpleasant. I, you know, I, I, I know what self-doubt feels like. It is not fun. It is like anti-fun. It really feels horrible. But, you know, what some, what, if you don't look at it and say, well, what is it that I don't seem to be able to do here? And actually take a hard look at it and say, yeah, that's right. I don't seem to have that skill. You know, once you say, yeah, I'm missing that skill, you can say either, well, okay, how am I going to learn this skill? Mm -hmm. Boom. You're now positive and goal-directed. Or you can say, you know, it's premature to do that given that I don't have that skill. I need another way around that doesn't require that skill right now. And in either case, you can find a way forward. And you don't spend, you don't just wail away your time. Oh, I'm not good enough. You know, oh, you know, my parents didn't teach me how to think straight or, you know, I mean, I, I, let me actually say, if you had bad things happen to you, you need someone with empathy to talk them through, to help you kind of process that. You don't have to do it on your own. I'm not giving people a hard time for having had bad things happen and being upset about it. Uh, so that I feel like this didn't come out right. But the no, point I... is, if you're if people basically indulge themselves in that sometimes, yeah. as opposed to saying, well, OK, that's real. You know, I had the childhood I had. I had the you know, you're divorced. I had the marriage I had. OK, well, <clears throat> there's something to learn from that. But right. But. And I probably do need to learn from that at some point, but what's the goal? What's the value I'm after right now? Mm -hmm. it makes a huge difference. You're not evading it. You are choosing your battles and choosing the values that matter most to you. Yeah, that, that it reminds me of a, um, say, say for instance, for instance, I'm trying to present a totally new kind of program, kind of communications channel, say for instance, at my job, for instance. Hey. Okay, just for instance. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, I completely relate to the idea of um, I'm not entirely sure. Well, I have a hard time sometimes um, being objective about myself in relation to my work and the people in my team and mm -hmm. how they see me and um, sometimes expecting failure before I even try and actually asking people for what I want um, uh, and, and thinking to myself, well, if I ask them, they, they may, you know, of course they may say no, but even, even, even deeper than that, I, I think, um, I, I kind of wonder if, if, if I, you know, if I don't come across well or if I don't have the right words to say right away, um, you know, so I, I I should say this. I, I have set myself up in some ways to um, for failure, or actually not even failure, but not trying in the first place. Right. Sometimes it's very common, and you yeah. see. But you have a goal, and you're clear on it. So you've actually now noticed. Hey, there's this fishy pattern here. <laughs> what am I going to do about that? And you know, you 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 probably won't solve it in an instant. But having identified it, Amy, right. you say. Oh, so I need to do something proactively so I don't just assume it's going to fail. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, and you know, I mean, there are, you can get a class on that, right? You know, or you can just do some thinking on paper. Okay, so I can tell this is the wrong path. <clears throat> I want something that's more constructive and I'll tell you this is where the threat orientation value orientation stuff is really helpful Mm -hmm. because as soon as you start thinking about well you know I'm not sure they're going to like this and I think they might say no how do you feel when you start thinking those thoughts oh really disempowered yeah right okay (laughs) so you know that that is not activating all your values right but that's activating is a bunch of threats now a threat is a threat to a value so just do the extra step say so you know name the things that you were worried about losing and then say okay now how can i get so name one of them amy what is one of the things that you're worried about when you're thinking about they might say no what just put it in words and we'll see if we can turn it around um uh well i I mean there's all sorts of (laughs) all sorts of interesting things i can come up with um just, uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, it's never been done before, for instance. Never been done. So you're afraid they might say it's never been done before. So, so, and, and we don't have the manpower and we don't, the, we don't have a blueprint for this. So, so pushback. Yeah. Right. No, but, but, so you're imagining these things, right? And why is that so disempowering to you? Because that's what I'm not totally getting. Because I actually think you think you have answers to that. I think I do. Um, it's just but it's that, disempowering, right? So, yeah. so what is the disempowering part of it? Uh, not trusting myself to just go forth and so and and just you know I can only prepare so much and I can only understand the situation so much. I actually need to start communicating, even if it doesn't come across exactly the way that I want. I mean, other people have free will and they can interpret what I'm saying in different ways, but I can't control that. But I, I can push back or I can right. um, counter, okay. you know. So hold on one second. Is it okay if I just try to problem solve this with you a little sure. bit? Sure. Because everything you said is true. Everything you said makes sense. But you're like problem solving it. Mm-hmm. Without our having really figured out what is the value that is threatened here that is making you feel a little squirmy. Right, because yeah. you have these ideas, but there's something about you're afraid you're not going to follow through, or you're like not ready. I don't know what it is, and I don't want to put you too much on the spot no. here, but it would and be I, really I, helpful if we could figure out. Well, it, it's it's uh, I mean, it's it's something that is actually in real life, and I don't really want to get into too many of the details, okay. but no um, uh, but I mean, it's something that I really really value about being where I am in my organization, and um, it's not it's something that I don't really deal with on a day-to-day it's sort of a different kind of work i could sh- i should say um a okay. different type of a role um but it's a new role it's entirely new it's uh um you know and i feel like i've gotten some support from some people but i i um i'm not entirely sure i don't i just i i have doubts about I guess this is what I need to do as I'm talking myself into it. Um, I need to be very clear about what it is my vision is and what my values are pertaining to what I want to do. And then I want to then ask other people if they share the same value. Right. Yeah. Um, This sounds right. That what you're afraid is you're not going to get any allies or, you know, people who will contribute to help build this and that it, it would be difficult to do it alone. Mm-hmm. Right, that you need that you actually need allies and you need cooperation is what I think I'm hearing, and yeah. what you just did right there is say, oh well, yeah, and that doesn't happen, that doesn't happen like that. Right. So what you just figured out is you need to talk to some people and actually kind of warm them up and figure out who are going to be the allies. Yes, and you yes. see, you feel a lot more confident if what you want to do is talk to someone to figure out if they're going to be one of your allies versus you have to actually sell them on it at this moment. Right. Right. It's like trim it's like you can you can succeed that is a task that is a task that takes less than two hours and you can definitely succeed because you can find out are they an ally or not in mm-hmm. less than two hours you can't necessarily convince them to be an ally in less than two hours but you can find out if they are or not see right. so that is a task you can have a hundred percent success on and you can feel very you know, joyous for having done, yes. and you can do it with every one of those people, and then you can reassess. And if you get zero out of ten, you will definitely reassess your goal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you get seven out of ten, 
you know, I mean, I don't know what, I'm just making up numbers here, but you get what I'm saying? Yes. Right. Yes. And I totally great, get it. Yeah. You know, and that's so much easier and so much more mo motivating than figure out the whole thing, get them into a room, convince them all at once <laughs> in a one hour meeting. Can't be done. Right. right. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah, and, and I appreciate um, in, in your, um, wor the work of happiness article that is on your website, thinkingdirections.com. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> there's a lovely uh, quote here. Um, uh, for example, suppose um, you're at work and you want harmony um, in part to, to make it easier for both of uh, both you and your coworker to get a job done. Um, but uh, uh, but you you're there, there's some political situation or there's there's something where people are talking politics in the office for instance but you don't want to lose your integrity and just say oh yeah i totally agree yeah um with regard to political issues <laughs> or start a war <laughs> or right. start a war right. i love this response that you gave here um uh to uh, uh, that that attempts to maintain some harmony but it, it's an honest response at the same time. Quote, I sense if we're in significant di disagreement on political issues, or I sense that we're in disagreement, I'm concerned that hashing this out could undercut our working relationship. I don't think we need to be in agreement politically to work together. Would you be willing to keep the political discussions out of the office? Now, I can hear the shrieks <laughs> of some young incoming objectivists saying, what, what? <laughs> How can we possibly diplomatically, reasonably say, yeah, I don't think those discussions necessarily belong here. Let's let's not do that here in the office. Yes, Let, let's focus on uh, the the um, the goals and values that we're trying to promote and achieve here. But somebody is wrong on the internet. Somebody <laughs> is wrong in the workplace. <laughs> you notice it's very important to have the positive of harmony that you're going after, which you think they share with you. Mm, yeah. Because otherwise it just says, you know, we shouldn't have political conversations in the office, which sounds like you're wrong. You shouldn't discuss politics, which you don't actually agree with. Right. right. You just think that this is not the time and the place for it. And you actually, you know, there is a time and place for it. Um, but uh, you need both. You need, you need the thing that pulls you together. And then you need the kind of a, objective assessment of what it is and 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 the request this is this is an example of using the marshall rosenberg offner method and it ends with a request would you be willing mm -hmm. to not have political conversations here in the office and if the person says no we've got to have it's got to be okay with you right this is this is the difference between a request and a demand a mm -hmm. demand it's not okay for them to say no a request it's like okay that's going to be new information Say, okay, that's information. I'm going to have to figure out how to deal with that because I definitely am quite uncomfortable with these. I really disagree with you. You know, whatever it is. Yep. Yes. Uh, there's right. so many great comments in the chat. I've just got to uh, re read a couple of okay. them. Uh, for example, friend Harper says, happiness part one. You know, mm -hmm. you, you just called your Ocon talk happiness two and getting into these advanced topics with the work of happiness. Happiness part one changed my life. Happiness became measurable in a way it wasn't before essentially banishing happiness anxiety uh, and then he asks and and that brings up the question and he asks about it in the chat folks ask about it in the chat but what is happiness anxiety well i haven't heard that term before but it's it's terrific i well, love the idea well, we may have to ask a friend harper what would you <laughs> guess he's referring to there oh, yeah. I, I mean i can imagine exactly what it is it's like oh I'm not happy. Maybe I'm not being rational. You know, what am I doing wrong? Uh, if, if, you know, if, if you think a rational person pursuing their goals should be happy, or if you think happiness means, uh, you know, daisies and, and bunnies all the time, <laughs> you know, then you'll be, you'll be thinking that you're not happy and that something is wrong and that this is feedback that you need to deal with when it's not. Right. And that is so there's an unnecessary worry, which you'll then have a lot of difficulty figuring out what needs to get tinkered with, because it's actually uh, it's actually too focused, actually, on the emotional state and not enough on the objective state. Outstanding. Because of the kind of topics we cover on the show, we've talked about 
so-called toxic positivity. You mentioned it earlier when you said, well, there may be real reasons you're not happy, and we don't want anybody hearing this advice to feel like there's something wrong with you if you're not doing these things or you're not getting the results. And so we've, we've covered that a lot, and, and it, it comes up. So I absolutely understand the idea of, well, if I'm not happy, there must be. In fact, I, one of the lines I use a lot is, I think, objectivists. Objectivists, more than anybody else, we are the ones who should be happy. We are the ones who should be proud. We are the ones who should achieve success. And we should be the most gracious and the most filled with gratitude, the most generous, etc., etc., etc. And then I have to say, well, here's my caveat to that, because I totally get that concept of toxic positivity. And if somebody's unhappy, they've got to be thinking, wow, there's more wrong with me than I thought. So I absolutely wouldn't want anybody to, uh, to feel that that is the point that's being made. We talk about radical ownership, and that relates to a lot of what we're talking about. Whatever happens to you isn't as important as what you choose to do about it. In fact, when you take ownership, then it can't hurt you. It can't hit you quite as hard because your real question, your focus, your, what you're paying attention to is what can I do? Mm -hmm, right. But again, I've got to say, well, but stuff's going to hit you. You're going to be sad. You're going to be angry. You're going to be depressed. You're going to go through grief at times, and that's okay. That That's emotions. What do we say? Your emotions have a job to do. Let them do that job and, and pick right. up the clues from it. There's a big difference between going through these bad things with serenity versus suffering. Ah. And you can get to serenity. If you, if you accept all the facts, some of which are, you know, real losses. Um, it's not, it's not a happy state, but it is a serene state. And it's not suffering. It, it, it's, the suffering is when you're fighting, ultimately, you're fighting reality somehow. When you're really suffering, you're fighting the facts. And real, that's, I mean, that's a huge part of the objectivist approach is all facts they're real. And we do have yes. a question in the chat that's a little specific and a little a little to the side here, but because I am interested in the topic, I've got to bring it up. The writer, Jim Ashley, says, speaking of writing books, Gene, <laughs> can you illustrate the idea of regularly seeing objective results to solving the problem of writer's block or artist's block or musician's block or scientist's block? He gives us a list so that we don't feel this is just right. about the writer's. Um, yeah, can, can you illustrate the idea of regularly seeing objective results to solving well, that problem of being blocked? Right. So this is a great example where if you've got it formulated as don't be blocked, it is thread oriented. <laughs> there's and something, it, it there's something actually, wrong. <laughs> it can't actually get solved that way. But I actually, actually have some, there's, I, I have worked this problem a lot. I've actually had some amazing success recently on this. So I'm just going to say the general thing you need to do, uh, assuming, so this is a big writing pro project and you're, if, if, uh, I'd say, um, let's say you're putting in two hours at a time working on the writing, right? You need to actually figure out at the beginning of that writing time, something that you can accomplish in that two hours. Now, what you can accomplish, you often can accomplish a draft, but early on you can do something like nail down, I have a bunch of things, like my selfish purpose. I actually have a 10 step, 15 step writing process in the thinking lab. Step one is identify my selfish purpose with writing this. Very important to figure that out first. Step two, identify the topic. Don't you need to know the topic first? No, you actually yeah, need to know I, your selfish purpose first. I know that, I know the topic, of course I know that, well, I can't really put it in words, but of course I know the topic. No, but you know, you can actually have a general idea of what you want to write about, but the specific topic you're going to say something about, you need to know why you're trying to say it. Three, you need to know your audience's context. So I have this 15-step process. Well, I can, in two hours, I can always get through at least one of these and sometimes more than one. Now, um, at other times, at, at certain point where it gets to like step six is notes where anything you still need to think about you think about and that's difficult to get to an objective ending on but i've got some new ideas like i've i've, I've got a new technique it's called notes on notes like you have short notes and then you go through and you mark that you number them and you write a paragraph at about each one it turns out to be much more efficient than 
just going off in all directions, which is what I used to do. I, I, you know, I'd do 50 pages of notes and then I was completely overloaded. I didn't know where I was. So I've now built in a pass. I've built in multiple passes so that every two hours I actually am finishing some kind of a pass on whatever it is I'm working on. And of course, part of this is if you're working on a 10 page book chapter, right? It's going to have some sections. So you, one way you can make sure you get something done in two hours is you only work on the first section or you only work on the second section. Or another way is you only work at the high level. Or another way is you just figure out the examples for everything that's going to be in there. It takes creativity to do this. But the investment of creativity to know at the beginning of the two hour block what you're going to get done at the end means that much more of the time you actually have something done. And if you don't have something done, you have uncovered a problem that you didn't know about. And that is super helpful. And you think about that the next day. So uh, it's, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm reading Jim's comments. And it's, I'm just so familiar with that myself, this idea of, well, but if I waste five minutes coming up with a list of measurables, that's five minutes less work to all get done. <laughs> and of course, well, that's... it's not measurables. It's actually, I think this is a big difference between... I, Okay. I, it's not metrics. This is what is the conceptual advance for so for writing. What is the conceptual advance I need to make here? And you have all different ways that you can see objectively you've made a conceptual advance suitable for this little time block. And that does require higher level abstract thinking and thinking about your process, but it is absolutely essential. That it's made a huge yeah, difference. I guess that's My true. newsletter's you... coming out a little more regularly. That's because of this. I guess you don't just want it measurable. You want actually to be a of a value, an actual goal yes. achieved. Yeah, that's that's the. I, I actually am kind of anti-metric. I mean, I think metrics are fine for monitoring, but for goals, metrics I think are completely for the birds. That's so radical for you to say, and I totally agree. <laughs> but I don't exactly know why. <laughs> but I, I get it. Right. You need to actually see a result. And yeah. the fact that you have got a number on a, you know, number somewhere. Right. It does, it's but not meaningful. The numbers are not meaningful. The result is meaningful. I like how you start out with your, your list of, um, you know, of your 15 things to do with um, uh, what is my selfish purpose in writing this? So in other words, you are establishing what the payoff is going to be right up front. Yes. And exactly. that's so right. helpful to motivation. Yeah, I guess yep. me measurables and metrics, I guess it can be like optics. Mm. It just puts you back on the hamster wheel, but not really yeah. related to your yeah, goals. Yeah, and I think... It can, I think and I th it can divert you from success because sometimes you have like, well, I'm going to put in, like a lot of times people have this, just put in two hours a day. I've had years when I put mm -hmm. in two hours a day, but a book didn't come out of it. Yeah, mm. I've got 2,000 words and they're 2,000 worthless words. Yeah, right. It's not... <laughs> It, it's it there needs to be an act and particularly for writing there needs to be a conceptual result and i think that's probably true for art also but you know that that's why it goes back to understanding what your values are your concretely what your values are who you are what works for you and yes. actually keep asking yourself those questions we, there were some questions in the youtube chat uh you know well what about sticky notes well what about this and what about that and, oh, yeah. and, the, and the question is really what works for you Absolutely. Um, right. And, yep. and, and there is a yes, you're going to have to go. And this is one of the my this is one of the things that I have an aversion to, but I'm, I'm slowly trying to become more flexible with is I'm going to have to go through a process of trial and error. I'm going to have to go through situations where I feel like I've wasted time. But in fact, I haven't. In fact, I haven't wasted time. That's a good that 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 was that was great effort put to good use, even though it, it, and it tells me. It may tell me what doesn't work for me, but now I know. I now I know that. Right. And so the point there is not to be afraid of that, right? Mm -hmm. And also not to expect it. And it's um, the there's a difference between recognizing that it's normal to have setbacks and failures, mm -hmm. and thinking that that's and 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 expecting them. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So you should never expect a setback or a failure. But it is true that, you know, what part, I think the key concept here is self-understanding. When I, when I talk about self-understanding, I mean, I mean, this is your knowledge of what you know and what you don't know. Your 
knowledge of what you're skilled at and what you are not skilled at. Your knowledge of what your values are, what is you know what the priorities of those values are, and also if you have some old baggage that gets in the way, your awareness of yeah, when I try to do this, that old baggage is going to get kicked up. And when you set a plan, it should take into account all of that. And if the plan doesn't go according to plan, you guarantee either there is some fact of reality that you really didn't know that you were now in fact out there, right? Or there's something you're going to learn about yourself and something that is absolutely critical for achieving this goal. It's not some theoretical thing. It's something about that you need to know to achieve this goal. And when that's the case, I think it is much easier to see, ah, I'm finding out exactly what I need to know to achieve this goal. <laughs> and I didn't know that. And that and I would use the word, not trial and error, but experimentation. Ah, very good. Because that's a much more positive word. Yes. Or yeah. run the run the experiment. <laughs> run the experiment. And the experiment <laughs> yes. may work the first time. Great. Yeah. Right. And it also gives you the exact right attitude toward you wouldn't run the experiment if you didn't think it was going to work. Right. 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 Outstanding. Obviously, we could go on. We've kept you over an hour. I just want to reiterate to folks that the, the values that are offered at thinkingdirections.com, uh, the blog has been outstanding. It's, it, if you're on the mailing list, you've been receiving these articles on a weekly basis, and you absolutely need to be on that mailing list. Uh, Thank you, Robert. We, we talk about ticklers being reminded of things that uh, that you need to know and, well, it, and get a little top of mind awareness there. Be on the mailing list, but also subscribe to your YouTube channel. Subscribe okay. to the YouTube channel. <laughs> but but you've got events, including free events. There's, what have we got yep. coming up next? The Getting Your Project on oh, a Roll, roll. event. Yeah. Uh, coming up on Tuesday. March 12th. Do take advantage of that. This one's free. It's free one hour That's... webinar. Oh, yeah. Where do you get free coaching? Well, uh, there is content that is not free, but is well worth the money as well on the site, thinkingdirections.com. You, you're advancing your, your understanding of the concept of happiness, happiness level. Two. It's just outstanding. That essay on the work of happiness. If you were going to say, what, what, if you were going to summarize, what is the price of happiness? Right. You've got to be willing to know your values, prioritize your values, and put in the effort to get them. It seems so straightforward, and yet, even within objectivism, within this philosophy, but really the world at large, we either think, oh, I just need to work and grind, we don't define, or we have a broad definition of, I'm going to be an entrepreneur, I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that, and we, we build a castle in the sky that has no goals, has no tasks, has no steps. Gene, this is outstanding advice. And uh, those of us who think we know these things and then get the opportunity to talk to you, we're reminded, oh my gosh, I've got work to do. <laughs> Folks, we've all got work to do. And Gene Maroney is exactly the person who can, who can help you do that. Gene, thank you so much for this conversation. And I hope everybody will take advantage of what you've got to offer. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Amy. I really appreciate being here. Excellent. Thank you, Gene. We will talk again soon. Folks, Take this advice, put it into action, go to Thinking Directions, and have yourselves an outstanding 